I'm talking about federal exemption for state authorized use of cannabis. And uh, that's my contact information there. I pasted it into the chat too, so I'm gonna blow past the screen very quickly. Um, so my story begins back, I'm sort of gonna pick up where, where Alice O'Leary left off with the, uh, when she was talking about being the scheduling uh, coordinator for Normal. Um, Normal filed a lawsuit um, somewhere in the 70s challenging, um, they started out with a petition to remove cannabis from the ske federal schedules and uh, then it turned out that the court ruled there was an international treaty involved that required that cannabis could be no longer than, no lower than Schedule 2. And uh, so the whole argument became whether it should be Schedule 1 or Schedule 2. So while that was going on, uh, Dr. Grinspoon in Massachusetts wanted to do some research on MDMA. And when the DEA got wind of that, they wanted to add MDMA to Schedule 1. So they had an argument about whether something with medical use could be in Schedule 1. And the court ruled that um, on the intent that Congress had when they used the term accepted medical use in treatment, and they couldn't figure out exactly what Congress meant by that. So they um, went through this series of stuff and they came out with a conclusion saying that um, it's possible a substance may have both an accepted medical use and safety for use under medical supervision, even though no one has deemed it necessary to seek approval for interstate marketing. So FDA approval was rejected. And uh, they also went through a thing about whether in accepted medical use means use and accepted in every state or um, whether it required, it could just be in a single state or how that would work. But they never did figure out what the word accepted meant. So that, that case got left and then they never appealed it. So it just sat there. So I'm involved in the normal scheduling petition and this is the ruling from 1988. And uh, you can see my name is on the cover of the ruling. And uh, the ruling was that marijuana should be transferred to Schedule 2 and that uh, it was um, in its natural form is one of the safest therapeutically active substances known to man. So that went on to appeal. The DEA administrator rejected it and uh, then it went to appeal in 91 and, and uh, this was Alice O'Leary's organization that sued the DEA and uh, the criteria for Schedule 1 is um, no currently accepted medical use. And then it says schedule two says the drug has currently accepted medical use. So the whole case hinged on um, the salient concept distinguishing these two schedules is whether the drug has no currently accepted medical use. And the, this case turns on the appropriate definition and application of that phrase. So. The court talks about, and this, this here is from 91. So the court starts out by talking about that Grinspoon case. And it said in the Grinspoon case, the, the DEA came up with a set of criteria for uh, determining accepted medical use that was rejected by that court because it was a carbon copy of the FDA um, licensing regulations. So they said, no, DEA doesn't know what accepted medical use is. Go back to the drawing board, come back again. So the DEA comes back again and says, well, they think it sees eight criteria. Well, then the court says, well, they find that three of those are impossible to meet. So then they reject the, the DEA's second formulation of accepted medical use. And so then they go on and say, well, these three of these eight factors are impossible to meet. So then they said, okay, come back again. So the DEA comes back again in 92, and then it goes back to the appeal court in 94. And they come up with this five-part test. And the court says, yeah, that looks, that looks okay. Um, so they, the DEA says, well, marijuana doesn't meet these five criteria, so it has to stay on Schedule 1. So that ended that case in, in 94, the normal filed that thing in 72, and I got involved in 85, and then here we are in 1994, and uh, 
they lose. So the next thing I'm looking at is um, we come into 2006 and the US Supreme Court looks at a rule that the DEA tried to pull on Oregon outlawing the use of controlled substances to assist in suicide. And the ruling there was that the DEA has rulemaking authority, but they don't have the authority to declare illegitimate a medical standard for care and treatment of patients that is specifically authorized under state law. Oh. So I, I looked at that and I said, well, that's medical marijuana right there. I mean, like, isn't medical marijuana a legitimate medical standard for care and treatment of patients that's authorized by a state law? So how in the world would the DEA have rulemaking authority to make that illegitimate? And people said, oh, well, that was Schedule II drugs, and so they were just prescribing them off-label. Since marijuana is in Schedule I, it's different. And I go, well, it's scheduled. It's a controlled substance. Like, what difference does it make if it's in Schedule One? And everybody said, well, that, it makes a difference. And I'm going, well, I don't see how it makes a difference. So anyway, I decided to challenge the um, Iowa pharmacy board over that and so i said uh you know accepted medical use in a state is is proof that it's accepted for medical use in the united states and there isn't any greater evidence a state law that says it's medicine i mean you can't what are you going to go do ask a doctor if the state law is valid that's, that's ridiculous um state law determines the matter conclusively so I filed with the pharmacy board and they refused to rule on my issue and um, they held hearings on medical use in 2009 and then they determined that marijuana has medical use as a matter of science. And so I appealed saying, well, wait a minute, I didn't ask them to look at science. I said, state law settles the matter. And the Iowa Supreme Court said, well, you actually won the case. They decided to reclassify marijuana and so you can't appeal because you won. And so I lost the appeal, but they recommended rescheduling cannabis, which Iowa never did after that. So the next thing is I'm in the US Supreme Court in a scheduling case with Americans for Safe Access. And um, so they won't make the argument that state law determines the matter. So I filed my own appeal in that case in the US Supreme Court in 2013 and uh, raised the issue that that five-part test that the DEA formulated in 1992 is no longer valid as a matter of law because in 1996, a state accepted it. And of course, now we have 47 states that have accepted it. So it doesn't, that five-part test can't be used by the DEA to invalidate state law to nullify state law there's a 10th amendment to the u.s constitution here and so that five-part test isn't valid anymore well um the u.s supreme court didn't hear my case here because i wasn't the petitioner i was just an intervener so um that never got decided so in 2017 i finally got my shot at it here in iowa we enact that our own medical cannabis law with cultivation and distribution. And uh, so we had a situation in the state that I live in where I could make the argument that uh, there was something legally significant about the state law. So the law that we enacted in, 19, in 2017 um, allows us to manufacture any cannabinoid. So uh, we're talking about cannabis extracts. Um, and it is so that it, it allowed cultivation and extraction. Um, it's called it was called a medical cannabidiol program, I think, as a deception to keep it low profile. So people think would think that it was a CBD only law. But you can clearly see here it says any pharmaceutical grade cannabinoid. So and that is not what cannabidiol is. So you can see. There's something really weird going on there. It was a deception just to sneak it in under, the, get the camel's nose under the tent. So um, it established a medical board um, and it, uh, that board, it established that that board would file an annual report every year. And it established over-the-counter sales beginning on December 1st of 2018. 
So in 2019, I uh, said to myself, well, the, you, can't, you can't decide that you want to challenge Schedule 1 if there's a way to avoid doing that. A court will not accept an argument that's not the best remedy. If you decided to use, if you wanted to nullify federal schedule one and there was actually another way that you could get accepted medical use without nullifying schedule one, then you would have to take that least dramatic uh, step. So here it is. Code of Federal Regulations has a uh, section that allows for exemption. And so under that federal regulation, we filed a petition with the DEA to exempt our state cannabis law from the Federal Controlled Substances Act. And this is just page one of the thing. I'm not going to attach the whole thing, but um, it's based on the fact that we enacted the state law and it asked the DEA to give us an, an exemption for our state authorized medical cannabis. And then I presented that to uh, legislators beginning in uh, February or January or February. I, I took that petition that I filed with the DEA and started uh, showing it to legislators at the state capitol building, which is that picture behind me there. And the Senate Judiciary Committee chair liked it. And so he held a subcommittee and put this amendment into the bill. And then the full committee uh, put this amendment into this um, uh, an amendment to the our uh, medical marijuana act and the amendment said this is in march of 2019 it said uh, notwithstanding any federal regulation to the contrary the use of medical cannabidiol pursuant to this chapter is not subject to federal regulation and of course that's not what i wanted i wanted it to say 21 cfr 1307.03 there i didn't want it to be so vague but nevertheless they thought they were helping me and that's what I got. So I took that and I presented it to the board and asked them to uh, beef it up. And so in January of this year, the board um, actually considered my request and approved it. And so the board said that the state should file for federal exemption. So they wanted to resolve the situation of children being denied the use of cannabis products at school because of drug-free workplace, federal drug law, and uh, elderly people at healthcare facilities were being denied the use of this because of federal regulations. And so the board wanted to resolve those two situations for our patients by developing language to protect these facilities which is impossible. It's a federal thing. It's not a state thing. So, or seeking exemption for Iowa's program from federal drug laws. So they, I, I went to the legislature and said, the only way that you're going to guarantee uh, the use of cannabis in these schools and healthcare facilities is with a federal exemption. So then the, the, um, so both the House and Senate introduced uh, amendments and they contained um, this language here. So this is, a, this, and it became law. So this, this was enacted into law this year in uh, June of, of 2020. And it said, the Department of Public Health will request guarantees from the agencies of the federal government providing funding to educational and long-term care facilities that facilities with policies allowing patients to possess medical cannabis on the grounds of these facilities consistent with our medical cannabis law or allowing staff to administer cannabidiol shall not lose elig eligibility for any federal funding. And so what happened was the department got that and decided that the only way to guarantee federal funding was with the federal exemption that I was recommending. So on September 4th, of this year, the Iowa Department of Public Health presented their recommendation for, um, well, they're, this is how they're gonna implement that statute. They're going to apply for federal exemption. So this just kind of lays out the, um, the reasons for it over here on the left. And then 
On the right, there's this section of the law that we just enacted about the healthcare facilities. And then right below it is the federal exemption language that I asked them to implement. So they're going to do that. And they're going to present that to the board this Friday. Um, the, the initial draft of this will be presented to the board on Friday and uh, we'll all get to look at it and review it and, uh, and determine what we wanna do with it. So there is also an existing federal exemption um, for the Native American church. And this has existed since 1970. So this is the only exemption that you'll find. And it is a broad exemption. It says uh, the listing of peyote as a controlled substance in Schedule 1 does not apply to the non-drug use of peyote and bona fide religious ceremonies of the Native American church. And members of the church using peyote are exempt from registration. So basically what I'm saying is that the listing of cannabis as a controlled substance does not apply to the non-drug use of cannabis if it's authorized by state law. And any citizen of that state so using cannabis is exempt from federal registration. Um, so the, the thing here is that you've got a federal administrative agency and the federal government is created by the states. And this federal government that the states created is exempting a church from flat out from schedule one with no explanation of, there's no limits, there's no restrictions, it's just exempt period. So if the federal government if the states created a federal government that has the power to exempt a church from the federal drug law, it can certainly exempt a state from the federal drug law. Um, there's a 10th amendment. If the church was required by the first amendment, well then the state would be required by the 10th amendment. I mean, these are constitutional rights that, and I don't know that this religious exemption is because of the first amendment, it doesn't say, but you could assume so that is my presentation, and um, I can go back to uh, stop screen sharing here somehow. Um, oh, here it is. Good Lord. So there we go. Right on. Thanks, Carl. Yeah. Look that at that. I'm just a minute over. It sounds pretty straightforward. I think it was section 29 or section 31 that uh, spoke about the federal funding. And um, I, I just, I was hoping that everyone kind of understood how that might apply, you know, with university research or, um, you know, we have one issue. Yeah. Let me share here. my screen again. Um, So I've got a page here that I made for the city is doing a uh, decriminalization thing right now. So I, I made a little summary for them. So basically the federal thing comes in with money laundering. Any business that's dealing with cannabis can't do banking. There's a federal tax penalty, 280E, that it says they can't take business deductions. They can be sued for racketeering and that includes a private right of action. Anyone can bring a suit against any one of these distribution or grow facilities for racketeering. There's the drug-free workplace thing I just referred to with the schools and the health care. There's even a death penalty based on quantity alone. The government's never used it, but it's on the books. And then um, the, just while, while all this is going on, the Congressional Research Service just did a thing on uh, educational institutions, tax banking, uh, research. So um, these are all the different things that are impacted by the uh, by the federal um, by the claim that uh, state law on its face does not provide an exemption from federal scheduling. Uh, it, in fact, the state law does create an exemption from federal scheduling. It's just nobody will say so it's like the emperor's new clothes or something it's um it, it's a state right it's not it's we're not asking the federal government for an exemption we're saying we are exempt and we want you to acknowledge it in writing mm -hmm.